Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our final seminar series of, of this semester's CRCC seminar series. Thanks for being here with us. Um, we're very lucky to have with us today Professor Marta Bivend Erdl um, from Prio in Poland, um, who's going to be speaking with us today about the nation in migration studies. Um, so as I think most of you know by now, um, we've been operating this Teams Live events function for a little while. Unfortunately, you can't participate in the seminar via video and audio, but we really, really encourage you to participate via the Q&A. So you'll see uh, a speech bubble with a question mark in there. Any questions or comments that you have throughout the duration of the talk, pop them in there. And when we come to the Q&A section at the end, um, Marta will address those. So do do contribute, even though sadly you can't do so um, visually or uh, via audio today. Um, I think the less from me, the better at this point. So I will hand over now to Marta. Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. If you can hear a bit of background noise, it's because of a tram line just in front of my office. It's been a, a great pleasure to prepare this and to look forward to this uh, to this talk to you guys at Loughborough. And I wish I could have come in person, but I guess we're getting used to these online talks now. But I'm imagining I'm I'm in in Loughborough. So I'm going to speak to the title The Nation in Migration Studies. And I'll basically try and uh, answer, but maybe at least discuss this question. Is migration studies reifying, ignoring and or vilifying the nation? And I know that people who are listening in probably are not necessarily working on migration and not necessarily working on nation uh, either, but I hope I'll be able to to make clear why this is an interesting question, maybe, maybe even why it's an important question. So I hope you'll bear with me and let me try to convince you that this is the case. So why would I be asking this question? Um, I led a project on negotiating the nation implications of ethnic and religious diversity for national identity, funded by the Research Council of Norway and looking at the case of Norway and partly also the UK and, and France comparatively uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and in the context of this project, we approached the nation as an empirical phenomenon, as a political project, something which enables mobilization and as a dynamic and changeable social group for which time and space are crucially important. And in this project, we wanted to ask questions such as who is a nation? Where is a nation? When is a nation? Why is a nation? And how is a nation a nation? So quite sort of fundamental, basic research questions within the field of nationalism studies, really. Uh, now, I'm a migration researcher. So what I was the most interested in here was really this part, who is a nation? And specifically in relation to whether or not the difference that makes a difference, if you will, today is about migration related diversity, which I think just sort of at a glance, public discourse, whether you're based in the UK or in Norway or in quite a number of different countries actually around the world, that would be what you might take away. OK, so then coming back to this question, which I'm uh, asking today is migration studies reifying, ignoring and or vilifying the nation? Taking the first part then, reifying, it might seem an odd claim given, for instance, the critique of methodological nationalism. So these papers by uh, Andreas Wimmer and, and Nina Glick-Schiller that many of you probably uh, are familiar with, perhaps you're even among the 1700 people who've cited this paper in International Migration Review on methodological nationalism, the social sciences and the study of migration and an essay in historical epistemology. Or maybe you're one of the 4,000 plus people who cited a global networks paper also from 2002-2003 on methodological nationalism and beyond, nation state building, migration and the social sciences. And maybe you are also not aware of this paper in general of European sociology, which is less cited, but still on the same sorts of topics about methodological nationalism and the study of migration. So how come it's possible to even claim then that, that uh, uh, the nation is being reified, given all this criticism and given all the attention that's being given to this criticism of mythological nationalism. But I'll try to convince you still that maybe there is a case for it. Moving on to the second part, ignoring. It again might seem a bit of an odd claim, given, for instance, the salience of nation state borders as defining for international migration as a phenomenon itself, or indeed the study of migrants, which very, very often remains only by nationality group. So the nationality in a way is defining for the research topic. So how can that how can I then claim that that migration studies ignores the nation? Might seem odd. Again, please bear with me. I'll try to make my case. 
And then lastly, vilifying. Again, also given the two previous mentioned points might seem odd, but in the context of approaches to integration, for instance, or in terms of research on deportation, and I'll come back to a little bit as well, perhaps there is a case for uh, an approach where the nation is being vilified in migration research as well. So what I'll try to do in this talk, and I'll speak for about half an hour, and then I hope we'll have some some questions, not too tough ones, but engaging ones, I hope, and some discussion thereafter uh, using the virtual options that we have at hand. I'll start by saying very briefly a little bit about how, how I approach the nation. Uh, then I will spend a little bit of time looking at what actually happens in publications within the field of migration studies uh, in conjunction with this question about how the nation is being dealt with in these publications. Then I'll try and sort of whiz through some sub themes in migration studies and say a little bit about how they substantively do or do not engage with the nation. And then to end, I'll uh, briefly mention a, um, a couple of efforts to empirically investigate the nation as examples possibly of trying to, to counter what I claim is a problem. Uh, and then I'll end on a note about normativity in what I think probably we can agree on is a political mind, minefield, namely the, the mix of where migration and the nation meet. So in terms of approaching the nation, I'm not going to, to try to, to summarize anything very elaborately, but just to sort of note that there, of course, is a huge literature on nation and nationalism in general. There is increasingly work being done on how the nation and migration related to diversity meet or, or do not always meet in, on friendly terms, perhaps. Uh, and I've put on um, a number of different references on the side of the slide here including if people who I know are here and have been contributed, contributing to this uh, research with very valuable input. So there are a lot of approaches to the nation. My approach is, as I mentioned, from uh, the work that we did in, in this Negotiating the Nation project. Uh, and at the end of that project, this is basically where we landed. So I'm simply going to read this out as my, my approach before I move on. The concept of nation here is approached with attentiveness to the political and the temporal the economic and social, the cultural and religious, and explored at the intersections of everyday experiences, the mediated public realm, and states' nation-building ventures. National identity is explored from the perspective that the national, whether as birth country, country of citizenship, as a linguistic or cultural community, or an ethnic or religious one, in different ways matters to most people. National identity may matter alongside or be subordinate to other identities, and sometimes with high levels of patriotism, other times with ambivalence, contestation, or even rejection. Taking together ideas of what the nation is, nationhood, the nation as it is experienced by ordinary people, nationness, various iterations of national identity are what, are what constitutes a nation. So as I then move on in the presentation, this is kind of what I refer to when I am referring to the nation in the context of this presentation. So what are the trends in migration studies publications in terms of engagement with the nation? I'm going to show you some, some graphs and images that are based on two different searches that I've, that I've done. Uh, one, the first one, which is based on searching uh, web science articles, which have uh, sort of the stems of migration and nation in the title for the period 1945 to 2021. And I limited that to social science and humanities journals um, sort of in the process of doing the search, basically. There, there are reasons why it would be interesting also to look at health, for instance, where there's a lot of work being done as well. But substantively, the focus there is not going to be on, on either of these things, but it's more the context of the studies. So more, could, more work, I think, could be done in terms of exploring this field uh, as well. But I've stuck with uh, a quite traditional approach to social sciences and humanities. And so as you can see here, some of the journals are, are sort of usual suspects, probably not very surprising that nations and nationalism appears among the top ones, but also uh, a number of the key migration journals, including Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies, International Migration, International Migration Review. So not that surprising, perhaps, what comes up here. In terms of publications per year, uh, we're starting. Uh, we're, st we're starting with 2021, and it moves. It moves outwards. It might might not be logical, depending on how you're used to seeing these kinds of figures. You can see 2021 that has less uh, than the two preceding years, which I would assume is because we're only still in late May. Uh, I think probably otherwise, this figure can be interpreted in light of the general increase in volumes of publications. I'm not sure it's it's easy to say that it's specifically related to the rise. 
of publications that focus on migration or on nation might be, but I, I suspect that this is very similar to uh, graphs that simply show the number of publications overall in the social sciences and humanities, where we know this has increased quite dramatically. I think the disciplinary angle is quite interesting also in terms of looking at who is it that is interested in these kinds of things. I think depending on where you, you where you sit in disciplinary terms, you might be more or less surprised, I guess, by what is found here. I think there are a couple of things that could be mentioned. First of all, um, it's quite varied. So there are quite a lot of different disciplines actually that engage in what I would say are two interdisciplinary fields of study. So this field of study of, of, sort of nation and nationalism and perhaps people who would attend the, the conference of the, for the study of ethnicity and nationalism. Uh, and then the other sort of subfield would be the migration studies subfield, which again might be fractured uh, and where people might be attending different conferences, more disciplinary or more um, thematic on migration. And it might depend on whether they're focusing on immigration to Europe or whether they're focusing on the impacts of migration in specific countries in Africa or in Asia, uh, or they might be focusing specifically on refugees. So it's not necessarily a coherent field uh, either in migration studies. But all of these researchers then are somehow affiliated to a, num a vast number of different disciplines, including the main social science uh, disciplines, as you can see here. So as I, as I alluded to already, the field of migration studies, of course, isn't it isn't a discipline as such, which is very clear cut. It's still, I think, debated whether it's, it is a discipline or whether it's an interdisciplinary field. I would tend to the latter interpretation of that as a driver for myself. There are fluid boundaries, I think, quite clearly between this field of research and different disciplinary um, identities, but also other interdisciplinary fields of study, such as uh, the field of study of nations and nationalism, especially in this context. So then the other search that I was that I've been doing, which sadly I haven't had time to update, but it's um, a search that included the period 1990 to 2016. Uh, and I did a bit of test searching on it, and I don't think there's been radical changes in the past five years uh, to what this uh, shows. But that's maybe for someone else also to, to perhaps pick up and pursue if, if interesting. But basically what I did was to try and look for articles that were published in Migration Studies Journal, so the ones that I've selected here in this period 1990 to 2016, and that actually had nation in their titles or abstracts, so the stem of, of nation. And I'll come back to what I mean by that in a second now. So you can see here that there are a number of different journals where this is the case. Uh, some of the sort of journals where there's little, uh, it's about how old the journal is. So Migration Studies is a relatively young journal. So hence in this long time period, they've not had, had that many articles. Whereas for instance, Ethnic and Racial Studies and GEMS have had uh, a long history and have many issues per year. So some of what we see numerically here simply reflects that kind of reality. But I think what it shows is that there are some articles that have nation in the titles and abstracts, which probably isn't that surprising, really. And then digging a bit deeper into it, I wanted to look at where are these articles actually focusing their empirical analyses? Uh, and not so surprisingly, perhaps the majority was in Europe, but actually quite a big chunk was also in, uh, in Asia. And again, maybe not that surprisingly, a big chunk was in the Americas. And of those, the majority was in, in North America as well. So I think quite similar to what we see in terms of analyses of, of empirical studies in many journals, I think, uh, across disciplines and, and fields of, of study. But still some presence of, of other contexts than Europe and the US and Canada as well present here. And then what's more interesting, I think, is I started to then go into seeing how this nation STEM word was actually used in the analysis of these articles. Uh, and so I found uh, these different iterations of, of nation that sort of came up. So cross-national, international, nation building, nation states, transnational, nationalizing, nationalistic, nationally, nationhood, nationalist, nationalism, nationality, nations, nation, nationals, and national. Uh, and again, maybe not so surprising, but I think quite strikingly, uh, the way in which nation is referred to in analyses is basically as a label, as national something or other. So the focus of attention in the analyses isn't really on nation, but it's a something, something else which is being described as national, which means basically in, in relation to my question in this talk, that um, the nation really maybe isn't that much in focus because it's being used as a label. So here are some examples of that. So national minorities, national security, national sovereignty, national level, national narratives, national context, national origins, national identity, the national, national belonging, or a national day. Uh, 
So these, I think, could be placed on a scale in terms of how close they are to the nation as a sort of study object and how far removed they are. Some are, are quite far removed. So the national is just a framing device for placing it within the nation state uh, boundary. And in other contexts, it's more specifically tied to the nation as an sort of object of study, for instance, in terms of national day. But there are also other uh, examples. So nationals, for instance, uh, referred to non-nationals, third country nationals, qualified nationals and nationals come citizens, which I think is interesting uh, in relation to the sort of conflation of, of nationality and citizenship, but also in terms of the very clear sort of boundary mechanism that we see operating here. So we can see that people are being defined as third country nationals. Basically, another way of saying that they're you know, definitely beyond the boundary somehow, and they're definitely part of something that is not us. So maybe not that far removed from the substance of the nation, but still perhaps not really studying the nation as, as an object of analysis. A couple of examples uh, of nationalism as well, um, long distance nationalism, instant nationalism, liberal nationalism, and there are many other examples as well. But just to sort of illustrate that once you start looking at how these things are actually being analyzed, quite a lot of different things actually are being studied uh, when you have nation and then the stem of that uh, producing different words that people actually are using in their analysis and using, of course, more or less also in the analysis. So what about the nation in all this then? I think um, going then into the question of how is nation mentioned, used and treated substantively in the subfield, sub, in different subfields of migration studies, uh, I'm not going to go in depth uh, into all of these, firstly for time reasons and secondly uh, because it's it's an enormous task in a way to try and sort of map this out. And I think uh, because I generally don't like to be unnuanced, I very quickly ran, in, ran into the problem of, of saying, saying to myself, you know, but there are exceptions and but of course, uh, you know, nation maybe is being discussed substantively by this and this article and this and this subfield of migration studies in ways that, you know, counter my argument here. So I'm gonna do this quite sort of uh, quick and dirty. <laughs> so bear with me in doing that. Uh, but hopefully by doing a sort of bird's eye overview of, of, of slightly more maybe than there is actually time to do in such a short presentation, something interesting can come out of it as well. So first of all, uh, it really is very, very clear that the national is used as a label and as an implicit referent in, in a lot of the, the studies that are being done. I just wanted to underscore that because that is something which is very, very clear. But then going through these fields then, if we look at the migration processes as a sort of subfield of migration studies, um, and I've picked a few articles here, um, which are from journals that are within the main, the broad field of migration studies, but not necessarily the journals that I was showing um, in the, the figures earlier. And these articles are articles or books that I, uh, that I know, and that therefore I can use to, to illustrate uh, my points here, but they're not really a result of a systematic, research, systematic search in terms of being you know, the most relevant possible articles that you could use to say something about this point. So to what extent, how and when is the nation being reified, ignored and vilified in relation to um, literature on migration processes? So I'll try and say briefly a little bit about how nation is dealt with in terms of literature on migration processes. Uh, and I think, first of all here, uh, it's not really the object of study. Uh, and I think that becomes quite clear when you look at the titles. So we have titles of papers here who look at, you know, trends within continents, and then we're down at the city level. Uh, and then very often we are actually at the individual or family or household level. So the nation as such isn't really the entity that is in focus, but it is very often a key reference because we have these nation state boundaries, which very often then end up defining the phenomenon that people are studying if they're studying international migration. For internal migration, it becomes a bit different. And then the nation state boundaries become the reference by being within what we're studying a particular phenomenon. So then moving to migration management and integration research, again, a selection of articles that I think can, can illustrate these. And, and by the way, these are worth reading in their own right, but perhaps not for this particular uh, exercise necessarily explicitly. I think if we look at uh, articles that focus on migration management and integration research, of course, there are, a, you know, as a vast, vast, two vast areas already in themselves. But I think what is interesting uh, to note is that very often we're then at the state level, so the nation state comes in. The nation isn't really that relevant to that conversation necessarily. It could have been perhaps, maybe it should be, 
but I don't think very often it is. It is the state part of the nation state, which is the key, um, key actor that is in focus. We see that in some of the titles that I have here, we have, uh, we have nation terms uh, referenced. So for instance, we have the Danish imaginaries of culture, race and belonging uh, in Mikkel Ritter's article on writing against uh, integration. I think this is it's an excellent article and it makes a very good point. But I think it's interesting also in, in how the nation and the nation states are related to or not in different ways in this particular context. And I think more broadly in the integration research field, we know that there's a lot of kind of implicit taking uh, the nation state for granted uh, and taking majority perspectives for granted. Uh, Mickey Richard then of course counters this argument, but I think there's some sort of slippery slopes there in terms of where the nation gets placed in those conversations. As you also try to critique, I think personally rightly, a lot of this literature which has taken the nation state view uh, implicitly to heart. And then there's literature also on deportation, um, liminality and these kinds of things uh, related to sort of the dark sides of migration management if you want. Uh, and I think in this literature rightly the, the state is often uh, viewed with a critical lens. But still it's interesting to see what, you know, where does the nation go as we do that. And we see again the, the, the Afghans being deported as a referent here, so we have a national category somehow, uh, and yet uh, that's not really the focus of the analysis of course. And similarly we see in, in the article on, on liminality and legality in terms of Salvadorans and, and Guatemalan immigrants as well. There's a lot of kind of national reference going on, but the focus of course in these studies is not on the nation as such. Two articles on citizenship. Uh, again, the nation state, of course, is, is, is key to this, right? Because we have citizenship in, in relation to the state. And then, of course, the, the literature on citizenship is not only tied to the state, and there's a whole big literature on active citizenship and lived citizenship and citizenship experiences and citizenship as something which is not only constituted by the state, but also constituted by people who are citizens and, and can act as citizens, whether or not the state has, in a way, uh, given them the, the, permission, the permission to do so. Still, the state and the nation state seems to be floating around in different kinds of ways. And I think, again, it's a little bit similar as with the integration research that very often we find that perhaps rightful, legitimate critique of the nation state sort of throws the nation a little bit out the window in the process without really reflecting on that happening. And I think it's interesting how in some of these works, uh, home becomes a referent, which is important. So home, of course, then also relates to the nation. And we see in, in Spiro's book, At Home in Two Countries, the nation is not really mentioned and yet it's there <clears throat> and a lot of the discussions we've had on citizenship tests and these kinds of things as well the nation is implicitly very present indeed and then explicitly maybe not really actively engaged in always uh, for various reasons and in terms of literature on the transnational turn in migration studies uh, which of course is uh, is probably well known to, to some and maybe not to others here the nation state again is a key referent and was from the start in a way in terms of reacting to how migration studies was framed very much as immigration first of all uh, and that one did not understand sufficiently the fact that immigrants are always also emigrants and they are actually the same people so we need to see this uh, within the same prison but also that just seeing things within one nation state frame doesn't give you the whole picture of what's going on so you need to really mo move your analytical lens beyond that. Now in this uh, transnational term, there's been a lot of different discussions that uh, focus on these nation state boundaries and their roles and transnational fields that span uh, different nation states uh, and the criticism of methodological nationalism has been taken very much to heart. And yet it's quite interesting to see how uh, implicitly still then very often nation state boundaries are quite defining for how we, we study things that are transnational also by which ways we label groups. Uh, and which within which boundaries we actually look at things as well. Maybe it's two nation states instead of one, uh, but it doesn't really necessarily do away with, with the rightful criticisms that the methodological nationalism point makes. And I think it's also interesting how some more recent contributions try to engage with this in more creative ways, also in terms of thinking uh, about uh, nationalism in different kinds of ways beyond connectivity uh, as well. And then the last sub-theme that I wanted to whiz us through is on race and ethnic minorities and super diverse diversity and encounters. And of course, this is it's not even two subfields. It's like a whole bag of different types of subfields. But I do think they have some things in common. And so here I'm referring to literature by, for instance, people like Stuart Hall or Stephen Vertovec, but also many, many others. Um, and I think one of the interesting points here is that sometimes the nation becomes quite central to the conversation. Um, 
But in, in other instances, that isn't really, really the case. And very often we talk about different aspects of group identities or individuals' identities uh, where a nation is part of the blend and it's not really made explicit how we relate to that part of the blend or it's being dealt with uh, quite superficially uh, and might, maybe not really intellectually engaged with in a very strong sense or it's being, I think, what I would say here, vilified. Uh, and of course, there could be, you know, sound political or intellectual reasons why we think that is the right course of action. But I think it's interesting to note that that is certainly sometimes also the case in this, this kind of literature. Uh, trying to tease out what we can take away from this. I think there are sort of perhaps six things that I can see looking through different fields of migration studies and how they relate to the nation both through more sort of quantitative bird's eye approach and actually engaging more with, with how different types of studies uh, discuss the nation or, or don't in some instances. The nation state is a very pervasive uh, figure. Not surprisingly, the world after all is organized in nation states, but that sort of comes up a lot and isn't necessarily always related to, even in many articles, uh, and I'm probably at fault here myself, who cite <laughs> the method methodological nationalism criticism point. So I think that's something many of us probably, you know, would benefit from thinking more through. Then there's a the question of national territory and boundaries. And as a geographer, of course, I'm, I'm probably more than average interested in the spatial aspects of these things and the boundaries and boundary making processes, which again, I think sometimes there could be more of an analytical effort to engage further with also beyond uh, geography. Then there's the national groups and there's a lot of that going on still. And I know why, because very often we need to define who we're speaking to or about and it doesn't always make sense to just speak to a random group of people who are defined otherwise. Sometimes it does, but I think sometimes still there's need for more engagement with what it does to the way that we study phenomena or answer with such questions in terms of how national groups very often are so central to that in, in this specific field at least. And then majorities and minorities appear a lot, uh, very often in the singular, sometimes in the plural. And again, that seems very often also to not necessarily be discussed very critically. And it's interesting to to sort of look at that a little bit, having um, looked at lots of literature that focus on the US context and the UK context and various European contexts where people write about this in English. Uh, and that the way these terms are used are not the same uh, in the literature, and they also are not the same in the realities people study. And I think sometimes there's a bit of a loss in translation here in terms of how we use and understand these terms then. And that certainly relates to ethnicity and race. Uh, there's a lot of, um, different approaches based on different contexts and then they're being written about perhaps in ways that sometimes are more similar than than, uh, than maybe the realities uh, would suggest. And then cultural religion and language which I think uh, are not focused on in general uh, enough in terms of how they impact studies where those are not really the key issue that is focused on and perhaps particularly language and I think that's interesting also in, in the context of how we write about things in, in academic publications in English regardless of what languages maybe we've conducted the research in and which languages are relevant to the people we speak with. And that very often, I think linguists have a good point in that we maybe, uh, as social scientists, at least speaking for myself, uh, don't really take language seriously enough. So I think there might be five, five problems that I want to sort of take away from this uh, with the literature. And, and this is very much literature that I'm contributing to myself. So it's, it's as much a sort of self-reflection, I guess, as anything else. I think we're struggling with methodological nationalism still, which is interesting uh, given how much we cite these, uh, these articles from 20 years ago. We're struggling with methodological individualism, certainly in migration studies, but I think in many other social sciences as well. We're struggling still to come to grips with groupism and culturalism and how we write about these things. We're struggling with the pervasive risk of essentializing. And then the flip side of that in a way is that very often we would become over-focused on boundaries and exclusion at the cost of, in of inclusion, I would argue. try and actually answer the question I posed. I think that's a good idea when you ask questions. Um, so I'm going to try and do that now and then I'll come in to, towards the landing because I know that we are coming more or less to the time where I said I'd stop. So to what extent and how and when is the nation being reified, ignored and vilified in the context of migration research? So taking the reified point first, I think often implicitly, uh, for instance, as, as, as an unexplored referent of the majority in the singular, where groupless and culturalism is a challenge. I think in nation state framing, which is all pervasive, uh, and where national level statistics, for instance, and, and choice of case studies never really are justified properly, properly or problematized in the analysis. Uh, 
and in the role that language plays in research and knowledge production. So sometimes I think we maybe are quite unreflective to our approach to language and the nation dynamics that come with that. Then in terms of the ignored part, the nation is often relatively invisible, either due to methodological individualism or ironically due to methodologically nationalism and usually in the form of nation statism in research um, that I've reviewed. Relatively seldom the unit of analysis and of actual intellectual curiosity as such is the nation. So it's rendered to the status of the label. And then maybe we could ask whether this ignoring the nation part is about it being too analytically slippery, too politically contested, or maybe somehow too close to home in the sense that it's just too difficult to grapple with. And as a unit of analysis, it's kind of both macro and micro at the same time. It's emotional and political, and it's kind of too all encompassing and therefore maybe is uh, is rendered slightly more to the sidelines than maybe it should. And then finally, in terms of the vilified point, nation state and nationalism uh, are often conflated and then often also conflated with the nation state. I think also in terms of the vilified point, uh, legitimate and empirically founded criticism of the state uh, is often very much less clear about the role of the nation and also very much less clear about the connections to electorates within democratically uh, within democratic nation states who very often uh, elect uh, you know pop political parties that have may have very different opinions about who the nation is or should be and thirdly by foregrounding exclusionary potential and realities which are there and should be studied of course and implicitly thus confirming their role and salience and I think perhaps then at the cost of studying inclusionary inclusionary mechanisms that are also at play in the nation which uh, also merit studying empirically, I think. So to, to wrap up, basically, I wanted to sort of say that uh, in addition to pointing out these problems and, and pointing a finger at myself and, uh, and as others, I have actually tried to uh, do some of the work of empirically investigating the nation in this project that I mentioned. And I have uh, put on this slide some of the publications by my colleagues and, and myself here. And I just wanted to show you one example this is a paper which is titled Interrogating Boundaries of the Everyday Nation Through First Impressions, Experiences of Young People uh, in Norway, which you, could, of course, can, can read if you're interested. But I wanted to show you here is uh, the methodology that we used where we had focus groups with young people in upper secondary schools in different locations geographically in Norway. And I think the interesting thing that we did here was that we took um, the category youth pupils in upper secondary schools as our entry points. And we asked them, whoever they were, whoever their parents were, however they defined their own national identities or other identities, to discuss the nation in the Norwegian context, so the Norwegian nation, and try to understand what does the Norwegian nation look like then from the perspective of these young people. And of course, we then came back to different types of categories and, and identifications, as you would probably expect. But I think there's a, there's a merit to starting with the realities as they maybe are on the ground and trying to understand them before you bracket them in with the different types of categories that we very often relate to in our research. And so from this research, we took the fact that experiences and, and perceptions very much are about what the nation is and what it ought to be, and that people are very often uh, not so clear about which one they're speaking about when, uh, and then that creates a lot of uh, interesting conversations, but also a lot of frustration and a lot of challenges especially in terms of how you want to understand the nation potentially as something which is both inclusionary and exclusionary. When are you then speaking about that as a normative ideal? And when are you speaking about the realities as they are actually experienced on the ground? And a lot of misunderstandings, I think, often uh, result from lack of clarity in whether one is speaking about the nation as a sort of ideal type category of imagined community and how it should be, or the everyday experiences, perhaps of everyday racism that people do experience on the streets and which maybe is not what many people would agree the nation ought to be, although perhaps some, some would also agree that that is what they think the nation ought to be. So there is a, a multiplicity and a, a conflict around what the meaning of the nation is, of course. So diverse nations are reality at everyday experiences and perceptions of the idealized nation clash. And I think intellectually and analytically in much of the research still are, are rarely worked on. And then I wanted to, to uh, as promised also in the abstract, say just a few words about normativity in a political minefield. I think working on migration mainly, but also then dabbling a bit with nationalism and nation studies uh, into the mix there uh, really feels like a political minefield, certainly in the Norwegian context. And I have no doubt it's the same in the UK. And I know it is also in a number of other countries. 
So I think an academic response to the politicization of difference should be to scientifically unravel the nation as it appears beyond, beneath, and with varying emotional reactions to national situations of neo-nationalists. And with that research that re really analyzes boundary making processes, policy in increasingly diverse European societies will lack fundamental insights that I think might enable constructive approaches to building shared national futures. And I want to dwell on the might because I, I know that this is kind of a, a tall order and the political context in many uh, in many countries around the world doesn't really suggest that there is an opportunity for this, uh, you know, exploiting the inclusionary uh, boundary making functions of the nation. But I do think they are there and we know they are there because nations as other groups have these mechanisms. The question is whether we want to actually see them and explore them and try and write about them and understand them and potentially also try to convey them to, to policymakers or not. And that, of course, then quickly becomes a normative question and, and for many of us, I think, it's, is experienced as a political minefield. So I'll stop there and I look forward to comments, reactions, thoughts, suggestions. Thanks. So I guess we, we come now to our Q&A. Um, please do, audience members, uh, use the Q&A function, the, the uh, question, the speech ball with a question mark in it um, to submit any questions that you have. Um, we'll put those to, to Marta and get those answered for you. Um, I should say as well, when I was introducing you, I incorrectly said that Priya, your, your research centre is in Poland because I went off the P. And having looked back, I can see it's the Peace Research Institute of Oslo. So the clue is in the name. You're in fact based in, in Norway. So I just wanted to correct myself there. Apologies for that. Um, we have a question already. Fantastic. Thank you, Marco. So we'll kick off with that. Uh, many thanks, Marta, for this insightful talk. I perfectly agree with you on the fact that nation is not investigated per se. Exactly for this reason, I believe that besides reifying, vilifying and ignoring, an additional point to focus on at the interface between nation and migration studies is remaking. How does a focus on migration and migrants remake the nation? But alas, very few migration scholars seem interested in this question besides you and a few others. So please do go ahead if you have a, an answer for Marco. Thanks, Marco. Um, yeah, I don't think I, uh, I don't think I have an answer. I think you probably have more answers than I do on this, to be very honest. And I've enjoyed all your writings on this topic. But I think you're right, and I think it's it's puzzled me a lot why uh, why migration scholars have not engaged more in a way. Uh, also, you know, rereading a number of, of articles and books and things um, with this more sort of nation um, question in mind. It's it's been quite surprising how um, uh, when that is not your focus of attention and when you maybe haven't had in mind the readings you perhaps did at an undergraduate level or something on, you know, nationalism and Hobbes, Mom and Gellner or whatever, and many people know that literature from that kind of more superficial level, that you still then refer to nation states without, you know, nation states and then people who live within them somehow without really thinking about the nation as somehow a, a group level category that you should be relating to. And even if you're then working with topics such as citizenship, for instance, that you don't necessarily um, go into engaging with uh, that the fact that the political community of the nation state, that is the citizens of that state, uh, should probably have something to do with the nation in that context. Of course, there are states that are not nation states and there are, you know, there are federal states and there are other solutions. But in, in many contexts in Europe, uh, we do have nation states where there is a nation which sort of imagines itself as being representative of the majority of the people within that country. Uh, and where the state actually has quite active nation state building efforts to socialize young people via schools, for instance, into those nations. Uh, and then if you are a migration researcher and are focusing on um, experiences of discrimination, for instance, of, of young people of migrants who has, have migrant parents, so descendants of migrants growing up in European societies. It's it's quite interesting how then you choose to relate to the nation. And I think um, I think it's interesting to also see how this follows, perhaps, or reflects the mood in the public debate as well in terms of the rise of populism and new nationalism and these kinds of things. That I do think we as scholars also become somehow shaped by it, and I think that's. Um, important that we don't isolate ourselves, of course, in an ivory tower or anything. But at the same time, I think we, we have to be very critical about how we do that or not, to not really just sort of um, you know, boost trends that are there somehow, which we inadvertently might engage with in, in less than critical ways. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question here from Michael. 
who says, thanks, Martha, with regard, to, uh, with regard to the final point you make about building national futures, many academics studying migration, etc., would argue that we need alternatives to national futures. How would you respond to those who say emphasize cosmopolitanism or the significance of diverse urban centers, etc., as a potential challenge to the nation? Thanks. That's an, that's an excellent question as well. Um, yes, so I don't I obviously don't have like a, a complete answer, but I can offer some thoughts. <laughs> uh, so I think. Uh, well, I think there's several different angles I could enter this into, I think one thing that I would reflect on would be that in this current uh, period that we're in right now with the pandemic that is at least in the Norwegian context, still quite quite an everyday reality. Although we are, I think, like you in the UK, starting to see the the end the end of it somehow, and, and are quite hopeful for the summer and the and the autumn. The role of nation state borders uh, in this context, in terms of travel bans, is just. I mean, I think it surprised most of us, um, and maybe it shouldn't have in a way because those powers to control borders have been there, and I think. For many migration scholars who've been studying you know, borders and, and migrants who try to cross borders irregularly, that kind of role of borders and the nation state powers that lie therein have been very uh, significant always. And that maybe also partly explains why, why there is a very critical approach among many migration scholars to the roles of nation states um, as such. Um, so I think you know, there's, you're right that there's, on the one hand, this sort of, can we, can we just do away with the nation state police uh, approach? And then there's the other role, which is kind of, well, we're not quite sure whether we can do away with it, but it's definitely evil. So I'm caricaturing a little bit, but I think that's partly how, how the conversation goes. Uh, and I think my take there is probably shaped by where, where, I, where I live and work. So in Norway, which is a welfare state, uh, which is, I think, relatively well, well run on a global scale. Uh, and where the welfare state is on the national level. And so there is kind of, we're in the same boat, solidarity sort of thing going on <laughs> in terms of being a shared fate community. Uh, and I think it's interesting that how, in the Norwegian context as well, uh, there is not that much reflection necessarily among policymakers and not all politicians. So only some politicians choose to speak about this and they are mainly the ones who are uh, keen on the exclusionary mechanisms that they can employ. Uh, the ones who are keen on the inclusionary ones sometimes say some things, maybe more uh, in the recent year than before. But I think in this context, it's interesting how uh, implicitly the nation state is referring to the people who are in this nation state boat as one group of people who are mutually dependent on one another. And so I think uh, as a long winded way of answering your question, I, you know, my personal take would be that I don't think we can do away with that. Unless the cities then are the you know entities that are actually collecting tax and are able to to organize the welfare provisions that we need, and in many cities they in practice do that, but of course they don't do that independent of the state in most of those contexts. In most of those contexts, the tax tax issue, for instance, is intertwined with the nation state level. But of course, in states where you have more of a sort of um, federal system, perhaps that is a bit different. And of course, people do live their lives where they live locally and in cities or in rural areas, and not at the national macro level. So I do think it sort of has a, it, you know, it, it reflects a more general point that people have in terms of their own uh, experiences uh, of life. But I don't think, um, I don't think it makes much sense <laughs> either empirically or intellectually to try to go there. I think my, my, um, uh, my take would maybe be that if we focus very much only on the city level, that is because we're somehow not engaging as well as we could also with the national. So I think it's more about bringing them into dialogue with each other in the ways in which uh, the empirical reality suggests we should. And of course, that is very hard to do when you're trying to research something because you can't really have a focus on everything at the same time. Uh, but in a sense, I think that would be probably more productive if we can manage to do that. Thank you. Um, so do keep your questions coming in. Um, if I may dip in with one of my own. Um, while you were speaking, Marta, I'm talking particularly about um, the construction of boundaries. Um, I was getting to think about, you know, the, the almost inevitable kind of expectation that we all have of mass climate migration um, in the decades to come. Um, so what's really interesting to me is this idea of um, is the nation something that's geographically constituted in the sense that it exists within geographical boundaries or you know, if we get to the point 
which we all hope isn't the case, but may well be likely at this stage that, you know, entire countries are uninhabitable. And, you know, people from those nations are having to leave en masse and, and move elsewhere. Um, do you have any thoughts or, or predictions or expectations of how um, that reality or, or possible reality might impact the field of migration and, and nation studies? I think it's, well, it's, it's a huge question, obviously, and I think um, it's an important one, obviously, as well. I think you're right that you know, there are some small island states where this is real now and where it's a risk indeed that you know not only some people who live in at risk areas close to the coast but but actually the whole island uh, will become inhab inhabitable and then what do you do do you move a whole nation to another country do you give them another country what do you do with that i think it's it's a question that we're not really necessarily as sort of as the world <laughs> rigged to be able to solve even so i think it's it's a huge question but i think what more likely will happen is that people will scatter right and then it becomes more sort of long-term question of what happens uh, if uh, if a nation in a way is, di is dispersed uh, and, and doesn't really have a homeland. And there I think we do have some historical examples, right? So I, we, we obviously have the, the case of the Jews. I'm not going to go into the political debates about, around that. Clearly that's quite complicated uh, and has, you know, created quite a lot of complicated challenges down the line for many, many national and religious groups. We also have other examples, right? So we have the example of, of the Kurds, for instance. So again, nation with no states or with semi-state-like federal solutions some places. Uh, so there are some examples, I think, of sort of nations that don't have formal states uh, status. There are others I could mention as well. But I think we could flip it around also and use an example that I think was discussed in, in The Economist uh, in one of the most recent issues. I think it was the case of Latvia, where they've had a, you know, a huge level of emigration. Uh, and they also have uh, a discussion there, of course, uh, on language and nationality in terms of Russian speakers and, and Latvian speakers and how to manage these things, as in, in, in some of the other Baltic states as well. Uh, and they've had votes from abroad about, uh, you know, what should be the main language in the country. Uh, and there, I think the boundaries of the nation in terms of, you know, who is in or out and how do you define the national sort of collective are, uh, are critical and are interesting because they're in flux. And at the same time, I think it's it's also interesting to think about this fact that, you know, so many of those eligible to vote actually are abroad. So that goes to your question in terms of what happens then if, if you know, the majority of those nationals somehow are abroad. And I think the temporal dimension there is, is really important. And, and we know that things happen over time. So I think if you look at the case of Poland, for instance, there the, a number of people that are sort of claimed by the Polish state as Poles living somehow abroad. The Polish diaspora, broadly speaking, is, some, is more than 20 million. And the country's population is, I think, at this point, 38 million and, and I think slightly, slowly shrinking. But, uh, but the point being that that number is also a bit hard, right? So how do you pin that down? So do you count only people who are children of two Polish born? Or do you count people who are children of, you know, mixed? Or should they be citizens or should they speak the language? So I think very soon you sort of come into quite foundational questions of who is actually the nation, which I think are, you know, fascinating and where we know that things change over over time and where very soon people belong maybe to more than one nation. And then it's a question, you know, do states think that that is possible uh, in terms of citizenship? Yes, they do. Uh, in terms of public attitudes, maybe the jury is still a bit more out. In terms of lived experience, certainly a lot of people around the world feel an affinity and a belonging to more than one nation at the same time. And I think there are a number of different conversations uh, that sort of come together in the question that you ask, which I think are, are really interesting research topics going forward. And I think probably the digital change that we've seen in the last 20 years or so is, is changing how we actually can understand these things because of the connections that we, we are able to have at a much more intense level than, say, the letter writing of you know, the Polish peasant in the US in the, in the early 1900s. Wow. Um, I mean, I might consider changing my specialism to migration studies. <laughs> um, that is, yeah, really fascinating. Um, we, have, we have another question here from um, Ija, who says, Hi, Marta. It was great. Many thanks. I was wondering whether nation and nationalism feature somehow in your new research about migration in Asia. Thanks, Aya. That's also um, a really good question. Um, yes, I'm st just starting a new research project on um, on the new middle classes in Asia and upward social mobility and 
what role, if any, migration may have played in, in the upward mobility of uh, pe families who are middle class in, in Asian cities today. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, I will definitely be bringing it in. We'll see how, but I mean, I have chosen the cases of, uh, of Karachi and, and uh, Mumbai, so located in India and Pakistan, uh, quite deliberately, which bring in a number of interesting threads, I think, on histories of migration, uh, in relation to the partition there, um, but also in terms of uh, connections between nation and and religion, I think in, in interesting ways. So I hope in a few years I might be able to answer that question more properly. But I think uh, definitely uh, that will be part of it. And then I'm also very humble about the fact that how we understand nations and nationalism uh, in parts of the world that have been shaped by colonialism uh, is very intertwined with how we want to decolonize our own knowledge production and how we want to relate with those qu kinds of questions. And I say I'm at the very start of really thinking about that, so I don't really dare to say much more. But but thanks for reminding me about that and uh, bringing it up here as well. It's uh, it's definitely something that I have on my radar for the for the coming project as well to to try and work further on and and exactly to to try and do that from a non-European context, which I think is is going to be challenging but also interesting. Sounds like one to keep an eye on us as that research progresses. Um, okay, we have a question here from Michael who says, did you notice any differences in the way that studies of different types of migration refer to or theorize the nation, for example, forced, voluntary, student or middling? Thanks, Michael. That's again uh, an excellent question. Um, I think the short answer is I'm not sure which is a bit annoying because I should have paid attention to that, but <laughs> but it's a bit of a kind of matrix puzzle in terms of what you what you try to look for. Um, my hunch is that there isn't a huge variation in that, in that I know, for instance, in the student migration literature, there's a lot of focus on countries of destination, as in nation states where student migration is um, you know, uh, a service you sell. So you're wanting to attract customers who are international students. And then on, in terms of origin context, because we know that there are, you know, in particular, India and China are, are, are um, among the countries who send a lot of students. But there are also a num an increasing number of different countries of origin who send international students to different um, countries around the world, including, of course, the US and the UK, but also Scandinavian countries, for instance, are entering into that international student market as well. Uh, my hunch there is that the nation isn't really in focus very much at all, and that, that is quite similar to what we'd find in in, um, in other types of migration research. Uh, on the forced, forced voluntary or refugee conflict related migration or not, I think it's an incredibly good question. And I, my hunch there would be that people who work on conflicts and the dynamics of political conflicts were, of course, ethnicity, uh, nationalism, mobilizing on, on group identities is very often a key feature there must be literature there that actually engages with that more fundamentally, and perhaps also with the ways in which people migrate. Uh, but I'll be very honest and just say I don't actually know. But uh, but thanks for the question. I've I've noted it. I definitely want to pursue that. Great. Okay. Um, we should have time for another question if anybody has one. So please do feel free to submit into there. Um, I guess for the time being, I'm, I'm intrigued to find out, you know, it's mentioned just that Martin, one of the questions that you have this new research taking place in Asia. Um, what else is kind of coming up on your horizon um, in terms of research and what should we be looking out for? Well, um, mainly I'll, yeah, I'll be working on the, a project that I'm already working on now on migration and development. Uh, where we are exploring the connections between uh, migration development and, devel and policy. So looking at migration management and development processes. And the interesting thing about that project is that we are actually not using national level cases. So we're doing research in 10 countries, but we're doing research in 25 research areas in these 10 countries. Uh, and that is partly as a sort of way to get around this kind of national fixatedness, I suppose. So at the policy level, yes, we do look at national level policies as well because they are at the national level very often. Um, but in terms of the empirical research, we're carrying out um, qualitative work in um, 25 areas and surveys in 25 areas in these 10 countries. Um, and I'm responsible for the qualitative data collection in these uh, 25 areas, working with colleagues who are doing, who are doing collection in, in the different countries. I'm working with colleagues in Pakistan on the, on the ground there, but otherwise coordinating it. But I think what's interesting there is that we're doing um, focus groups. And I've sort of been thinking about 
whether focus groups can be helpful as a, a way of, of um, getting past what I refer to here, and which is, is the critique often of quantitative studies of methodological individualism. Uh, and I'm sort of wondering what we'll find in our focus groups with like, I think we'll have 100 focus groups in total uh, in these 25 areas about migration and development and life in the different areas, etc. cetera. Uh, and I'm sort of wondering how we can then understand that at a more collective level, which is not the individual, uh, and it's not also the national level somehow, but it's people in that specific area, which of course is located within a country. Um, and uh, I'm intrigued to see whether we'll find any references to, you know, nation implicitly or explicitly, but that remains to be seen because that work is partly done and partly uh, delayed by the pandemic, and we're trying to do it as and when it's uh, safe in relation to that. That's mainly what I'll be working on uh, in, in addition to this migration with this project on social mobility and migration in Asia. Wow. Um, again, it sounds really fascinating, especially the idea that you know people's uh, national identities aren't necessarily just national and, and may come from kind of subdivisions of, of where they live and where they're from. So, yeah, it sounds amazing. Um, we are coming up to the, to the end of the hour, so we're pretty much bang on time for, for two o'clock. Um, so just to say a huge thank you to Marta for joining us, uh, for sharing your, your thoughts, your insights and um, information about all this exciting upcoming work as well. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us, uh, especially also if you've been to other seminar series this term, we, we appreciate that. Um, today is the last one of this semester, so I think um, we'll be back in beginning of next year, September, October time. Um, but again, for now, Marta, I know you said if people have um, questions arising that they think about as a result of today's talk, they can drop you an email. Um, and uh, Marta's uh, institutional page is linked through our CSCC website, but I think she should be fairly easy to find as well if you type in Priya and her name. Um, so do feel free to, to keep that dialogue going should anything arise um, as a result of being here today. Um, but again, just to say once more, thank you ever so much for, for your time and for being with us. Apologies, it couldn't be in person, but um, what a fascinating talk for a Friday afternoon, so much appreciated. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you everybody, take care.